This is Phil Koopman, and I'll be talking about autonomous ground vehicle safety, and in particular, lessons that we should be learning from the experiences of 2023. As an overview, 2023 was a pivotal year for robotaxis. We had the summer of hype, followed by the winter of discontent. And the question is, will we see a glorious summer of 2024 or 2025? Or will things take a lot longer to mature? I think we'll have a sooner good outcome if we learn some top lessons for AV success from the experiences from this year. In particular, we need robust criteria to decide whether safe enough or good enough to deploy is really true of the current technology. And the second thing is we need to create more sustainable trust between the companies making these vehicles and the other stakeholders. Let me start with a quick overview of why autonomous vehicle safety is so complicated. To begin with, there are very high public expectations. People expect superhuman machine performance in part because that's what the industry has been trying to sell. Trust is very easily given. You have a couple of nice demo rides and everyone says, look at this, it's great technology. When can we scale up? Then when it turns out there are problems scaling up, there's a lot of backlash because expectations were set so high. The reality is this capability still has a long way to go before it's going to scale up without a lot of disruption, without a lot of issues, and expectations need to be managed appropriately. It's also complicated because there are technical challenges. A core technical challenge is that machine learning safety is still a work in progress. It uses a statistical approach based on training by example, but when it encounters something it hasn't seen an example for, it can struggle. And so the issue with safety in particular is safety is usually controlled by the frequency of high consequence rare events. And that's exactly the place where machine learning is at its worst. So this is a fundamental clash that's going to have to be resolved as we scale up the technology to achieve safety. Another reason this area is complicated is because there's a traditional clash across cultures, and we've made a lot of progress improving this, but there's still a ways to go. The issue is that you have four different communities coming together to make this technology, and they have four different historical paths, none of which have everything needed to make this technology succeed. So the four areas are first autonomy researchers. They spent decades making the cool demo and they are really cool demos working, but that's not the same as having a scalable technology with safety. There's Silicon Valley who's all about move fast and break things. And that can work for consumer products, but when the things you're breaking are people on a road, that can be an issue. And there's automotive, who for decades has been able to blame drivers for not managing failures that happen to their equipment. And now all of a sudden, there's no human driver in there to manage the failures when they occur. And finally, there's the regulators. They've been very equipment system level test centric. And they have historically had weak digital safety expertise, but now it's all about computer safety and that's not their strong suit. These four areas need to come together, find common ground to make this technology succeed, and that's still a work in progress. Roby taxi companies are fond of saying safety is our number one priority. All the companies say that, and there's also robotic truck companies that will say similar things. This talk's concentrating on the robo taxis, but they all end up in the same place. They know that they have to have safety. But it gets complicated when you ask what they mean by safety and how they plan to measure their safe and where they are on the path. But they start out with the slogan, yep, safety is number one for us. OK, great. But what exactly does that mean? When you dig in a little bit, a lot of the public communication from these companies amounts to rhetoric. Nobody knows when or perhaps even if autonomous vehicles will be safer than human drivers at scale. There are current studies that are promising, but they're limited. And in particular, they're looking at fairly low severity crash events for the most part because we just don't have enough miles. The reduced fatality rates are aspirational. When a company says we're out there saving lives, we don't actually know how that's going to turn out. They may honestly think they are, but the data is insufficient to really know how that's turning out. Indeed, some humans drive drunk. Abs that's absolutely a problem that we should work on independent of autonomous vehicles, but on average, they're still remarkably good and adaptable. On the other hand, computer drivers, they may not drive drunk, but they lack common sense. In particular, they're brittle to novelty. 
are the machines going to be better drivers than humans? Or are humans going to be better drivers than machines? It's too soon to tell how that's going to turn out. But the one thing we are sure of is you cannot simply assume that a computer will be a perfect driver simply because it doesn't drive junk or because it's a computer. The safety has to be engineered into these systems and cannot simply be assumed to be present. A big milestone in 2023 is we saw two companies reach 1 million miles of driverless operation on public roads. Both Waymo and Cruise achieved that goal in 2023. Waymo put out a safety report pretty quickly saying we have no reported injuries and we have this good safety track record. Uh, and that was really impressive information, although it should be noted that things have changed. In August, they did have a passenger injury. Cruise also put out a report later that year uh, extolling that they had fewer collisions and fewer collisions with primary contribution. But in both these cases, the data wasn't the totality of everything that happened. They focused on at-fault crashes. So there's some limits to the data. Things have happened since this data was collected. And so what we should take away from this is that they have some data suggesting they could be good drivers, but it isn't really clear how things are going to turn out in the long run. And you have to be very careful to read the limitations of these studies because they're a part of the story, an important part to be sure, but they're only a part of the story. There's more to safety than this. So are they safer? Well, no one really knows. The press releases overstate the company's study results. The, com the study will say something very narrow, and the next thing you hear, the soundbite is, yes, we've proven that we're saving lives, we're proving that we're safer than humans. Well, eh, not really. We're not there yet. The studies typically look at at-fault crashes. They, one of them uses a ride-hail driver baseline, which is not a particularly safe baseline. But more importantly, the claims being made by the industry are about fatalities. And fatalities are going to take 300, 500, million miles, a billion miles, some number like that to find out how the fatalities actually turn out. Because for human driver baselines, it's only about 100 million miles per fatality, depending on, on the specifics. And the companies are at right now at about 5 million miles. Well, uh, 5 million miles done, 95 more million to go before even close to being able to know how this turns out. So the current studies are hopeful. The current studies are a good sign but they're predictions and extrapolations. We don't know how the answer is going to turn out yet. So any claim of we're saving lives is still aspirational based on the data. Way to look at this is if you're running a marathon, a really long road race, and you've run one mile and your time splits look great, you're on track for setting a record for the next 25 miles. Well, okay, I'm glad that you have a really good time at one mile, but it's a little early to give yourself the gold medal for winning the marathon. And that's kind of where we are with this technology. It looks really good, but we're still in the very early stages of seeing how this turns out. So that brings us to the summer of 2023. We saw peak robo-taxi hype in July 2023, and arguably it was this ad taken up by Cruz in the New York Times. Humans are terrible drivers, and all these Americans were killed in car crashes, I guess by human drivers is the point. And... We're here, our robotaxi is here to fix that. And that's clearly the tech intended takeaway from this ad. And they talk about we had fewer collisions as primary contributors, so they're only counting the ones where they're mostly at fault. And they also have never been distracted, drowsy, or drunk. Okay, well, yes, it is true that computers don't drink alcohol and don't get drunk, but it's not true that they're perfect drivers. So the issue with this ad is that it sets the industry up for an expectation of basically being perfect drivers. Uh, and in particular, it just tempts the media to go wild anytime you see a robo-taxi doing something embarrassing, which is exactly what happened. Now, the context for this ad is kind of interesting because before this ad came out in March 2023, we had a very graphic demonstration of the fact that computers are not going to be perfect. At that point, a cruise robo-taxi rear-ended a San Francisco city bus. And the accident report made it clear there was no extenuating circumstance. The car saw the bus, but due to an internal logic error, it hit it. Simple as that. I and mean, there's a long explanation about how the software defect happened, but you had defective software causing a robo-taxi to run in a bus for no particular reason other than the bug. So the question is, you know, are software bugs the new drunk driving? 
people don't have software bugs in them. Our brains don't work that way. We have other cognitive issues, but not software bugs. And uh, robotaxis will have software bugs. And in fact, this was the beginning of seeing robotaxis make the same kind of mistakes human drivers make, but for different reasons. After that ad came out, the news was just really fixated on reporting any time a robotaxi did something wrong. Here's one. Here's a robotaxi going into a construction zone. There's road closure signs. There's a flagman. There's all this stuff, but it decided to go through the closed road anyway. Here's another one also from August 2023, where a robotaxi got stuck in wet concrete in a pretty clearly marked construction zone. These situations were embarrassing, to be sure. Did they prove that robotaxis were unsafe? Well, you know, that it's not really. I mean, nobody was hurt in any of these things. Certainly, they're a reason for concern. But the damage that was done was not disproving safety. The damage that was done was undermining the company narrative. The industry had said, we're going to give you basically perfect drivers that never make stupid mistakes. And here they are making stupid mistakes, the same mistakes humans would make. To be sure, humans make these mistakes too. But arguing that humans make these mistakes doesn't make it okay when the whole narrative has been robotaxis will not make human mistakes. Well, here's the photographic evidence. Now the industry has a reputational problem. They've made promises they're not fulfilling. There are more substantive concerns. The city of San Francisco documented dozens of incidents of these vehicles interfering with public transit, but in, these, in this graph with um, emergency responders. Fire trucks, police response scenes, ambulances, they were going in, they were obstructing emergency vehicles that had their flashing lights on, they were intruding into emergency scenes and causing disruption, uh, they were blocking fire stations so fire trucks couldn't leave the station if there were called, those sorts of things. And these are typically not things on the usual list of safety hazards, but it turns out that they also matter. So if you say, we're just going to measure ourselves by how many uh, people are harmed during crashes, you're missing out on a lot of the other things that really matter in a practical sense for whether these robotaxis are going to be good, acceptable road users. Summer turns into fall. By the end of summer, we saw coning. People in San Francisco were really fed up. Some people liked the robotaxis, but some people were very unhappy with them, including the city government and including a bunch of other folks as well. And they came upon this idea of coning the vehicles. What they would do is they would put a construction cone on the hood of a vehicle. They just set it up on top there, and it would confuse the vehicle to the point it wasn't sure what to do, and it would come to a stop in the middle of the road. So they went around the city putting cones on the hoods of these vehicles as a denial of service attack against the robot taxi companies. This was a sign that at least some of the population was really frustrated with the technology. Nonetheless, in August, the Public Utilities Commission told the robot taxi companies they had free reign to operate. Now, California, one of the things that goes on is the city of San Francisco has no say in robo taxis because the state has passed a law, a municipal preemption law, saying the city gets no vote, the state decides, and the state decided it's okay to scale up the robo taxis despite all these problems, despite the public unhappiness. By September, you get a divided city. Part of the city thinks robo taxis are going to make life wonderful, and it basically argues that cheaper ride share is going to fix a lot of problems of the city. And the other side is really unhappy, kind of for the same reason, because they think that rideshare is a bad thing and cheaper rideshare will make it worse. And by the way, they're worried about other disruption of public services and they're worried about safety. And that's where we are in September. It was clear that things were really heating up. And the question was how long this situation would last until the inevitable bad mishap happened that caused a big change. Which brings us to the October 2nd crash. There was a somewhat complicated crash, so I'll walk through it, but this really caused a problem for crews and for the whole robotaxi industry. In that crash, there was a pedestrian crossing on the far side of an intersection in front of two cars. One car was a human-driven vehicle next to the cruise robotaxi, and then there was a cruise robotaxi. The pedestrian was crossing as the light changed, so technically they should not have been crossing because their light was red and there was a green light for the vehicles, but the pedestrian crossed in front of these two cars and the uh, human-driven vehicle hit the pedestrian in the lane next to the cruise robotaxi's lane. That pedestrian was 
pushed back into the lane of the Cruzorba taxi, which did not stop in time and struck the pedestrian. Now, if it had stopped there, it would have been interesting to see what the discussion was, uh, because arguably the crash was not avoidable, but that isn't where it stopped, and this is where it gets to be a real problem. After the cruise robot taxi had stopped, it then decided to pull to the side of the road with the pedestrian under the vehicle and drag this person about 20 feet at speeds up to 7 miles an hour under the car, stopping with the pedestrian almost completely under the rear of the car with just her feet sticking out and stopped with the wheels on top of the pedestrian's feet. To make matters worse, there were allegations that Cruz tried to cover up that this had happened. Uh, for sure, the public never heard about the dragging until later. They just heard that there was this crash. A California Department of Motor Vehicles said that they heard that same partial story. Uh, the facts on that are still disputed. We'll see how that turns out. But the fact that the injury was compounded by moving the vehicle after the initial crash and the alleged cover-up caused California Department of Motor Vehicles to suspend the operational permits for driver out operations for crews, so they were effectively shut down in California other than driver in testing. The aftermath of Cruz is still playing out as I record this. Uh, Cruz will somehow resolve its situation. We're going to see how that is, but for now it looks like spending cuts, single city operations instead of a big scale up. Other outcomes are possible. We'll see how that turns out. If Cruz wants to succeed, they will need to pivot hard into safety, transparency, accountability, and those types of things. But Cruz is not the only company affected. The entire autonomous vehicle industry is affected by this negative press that happened to one company. Other companies are going to continue to develop. They're doing heavy trucks. They're doing local deliveries. They're doing low-speed shuttles. There's even companies doing, I call it level two plus plus plus. That's not an official term, but it means they want it as close to not requiring a person as possible, but they can still blame the person if something bad happens. All the co all those are still being deployed by other companies, and I would suggest that all those companies need to take to heart the lessons that became evident with this cruise mishap and the sequence of events in San Francisco over the summer. So what happens next? We need to learn some lessons as an industry. The first one is net better than a human driver is only a starting point. It turns out it's really complicated and it's very difficult to prove up front because you need hundreds of millions of miles to prove that you're safer and you're not going to get them all at once. Even worse, if you have any mishap that occurs while you're getting those hundreds of millions of miles, it undermines your claim. You, you can say at the same time, well, we don't have enough miles to prove we're safer, but a bad thing happened. You know, trust us, we're going to get more miles. And, and you can only have so many bad things happen before people stop believing you. Now, one mishap I hadn't mentioned yet is that in August, there was a cruise vehicle that had a crash with a fire truck. The scenario is that it did not yield to a fire truck that had its lights on and horn going. Uh, and, and was struck at an intersection. This caused California DMV to ask crews to cut their deployed fleet in half, so they were in effect on probation when that other later pedestrian crash happened. But it doesn't take too many crashes like this for people to lose confidence, even though you're still hundreds of millions of miles away from knowing how the fatality rate is going to turn out. So to really stay the course, you need to not only say we're going to be better than a human driver and have some argument saying you're on your way, but you have to address a bunch of other areas as well. And those include negligent driving, risk transfer, recall issues, safety standards, ethical and equity concerns, and sustainable trust. And I'll hit each one of those in turn. If criteria number one is you have to at least be better than a human driver and you have to have a way to show that, criteria number two is you also have to avoid negligent driving. I would say negligent driving for a robotaxi involves establishing a duty of care to other road users. Right now, that's not actually the law in the U.S., but eventually there will need to be a law that says, in, indeed, a computer driver has the same duty of care for the safety of other road users as a human driver would have. Then ask, was a loss event caused by a breach of the duty of care? Did the driver act recklessly or did it do everything possible and there was no way to avoid the crash? Those kind of questions need to be asked the same as they would be asked for a human driver. If a human driver runs a red light and hits someone, they're probably going to be found negligent because they should have stopped at the red light. They were doing something wrong at the time the loss event happened. 
the same criteria should be applied to robotaxis. A key result from this is that statistical safety arguments don't work here. If you, as a human driver, are incredibly safe, you've never had a crash your entire life, you don't get a free pass to run red lights. You're still expected to behave responsibly. Saying that I'm a safe driver, so it's okay to flout the law, doesn't work when you have a crash that flouting the law resulted in a loss event. And the same is going to apply to robotaxis as well. Statistical safety isn't enough. You also have to not drive negligently. And this arguably played as a factor in the cruise mishap from October 2nd. By all accounts, the robotaxi had the ability to sense that the pedestrian was in the crosswalk and was going to be hit by another vehicle. A prudent human driver would have said, something bad's about to happen, I'm going to slow down so I'm not anywhere nearby when the bad thing happens. Regardless of whether you think the robotaxi should have been that sophisticated, the other thing is the robotaxi should not have moved with the pedestrian under the vehicle. If your vehicle hits a pedestrian and you don't know where the pedestrian is, you should not be moving your vehicle. And so that is one of the reasons why this is such an issue for that mishap, setting aside any claim of statistical safety. Another requirement is to avoid risk transfer. Hypothetically, and this is a thought experiment, what if the number of people hurt by robotaxis is half what is what are hurt by human drivers, but at the same time, all of them are children. Now that's an extreme example that would never really happen in practice, but the idea is that even though you reduce the total aggregate harm, there can be patterns to the harm that are socially unacceptable. Now, why did I pick children? Well, in fact, there was a news article accusing Cruz of putting itself at risk of this. Now, there's caution that should be applied to this particular article. The interpretation of the materials the journalist had access to are contested, and so we should not draw any conclusions from this article. But the point is, the headline is going to get attention. If you have a headline saying a car company knew that they were putting children at risk, that's going to be a problem. And it points out that a statistical net risk argument isn't good enough. You have to also make sure that any group is not put at increased risk, even if the total risk goes down. And you probably have to spend extra effort for vulnerable groups to make sure their risk is reduced at least as much, probably more than the average risk improvement. The fourth thing to consider is fine grain risks in regulators. You want to avoid regulatory recalls. Each recall is a piece of bad news. Uh, and But recalls aren't about net risk. They're about undue risk in the small, specific issues. And so, for example, if NHTSA has a recall for automated vehicle technology, uh, these are real examples. It's because the vehicle is rolling through stop signs instead of stopping, or it was having an elevated rate of phantom braking, or it had a malfunctioning display console. These recalls are not about the total net risk. They're about specific risky behaviors. And so not only do you need to have good statistical net risk, but you have to not display specific risky behaviors, even if safety in other areas compensates for it. Currently, regulators aren't doing a lot with software safety, but there's a proposal in 2020 from NHTSA to require industry safety standards. Right now, that's inactive, but perhaps we'll see that get traction over time. Which takes us to number five, using industry safety standards to set an expectation of safety. There are numerous industry consensus standards dealing with safety that are available for the industry to use, and the question is, do they use them? As a foundation, you have Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, FMVSS. Uh, those have to do with, do your airbags work? Do your headlights work? Uh, it's basic vehicle functions for all vehicles, not automated vehicles. And you have NCAP, which is a star-based system for things like crash tests, with Euro NCAP also having some active safety evaluation. There's also cybersecurity standards. There's functional safety standards. ISO 26262 is the automotive equivalent of functional safety standards in other arenas, such as IEC 61508. There's dynamic driving function standards that have to do with functional insufficiencies and the fact that sensors aren't going to have 100% accuracy rate. There's system level safety standards that encompass all th these things, but also what happens about post-crash response and the things that have to do with beyond dynamic driving task. In general, the industry has come to recognize that they need an overarching vehicle safety case that accounts for all these pieces. And there's a standard that uh, talks about 
how to put one of those together and how to evaluate that it's complete and consistent. And by the way, there's also a road testing safety standard. All these safety standards are already issued. They're out there. Any car company could use them if they want to. But right now, the government only requires the vehicle safety ones and none of the rest of them. And there are no companies that say they conform to the other safety standards. They may do pieces of them. They may have internal practices informed by them. But trying to find a company that will publicly say, yes, indeed, we conform to any one of these safety standards. If you look, you won't find that. I think over time, that's going to have to change for the industry to build more trust. Number six is ethical and equity concerns. Before robo-taxis, there was ride hailing. And ride hailing threatened to put taxi companies out of business. And they made promises about how the world would be such a better place with ride hailing. Uh, and they give disappointing results. Why do we expect robo-taxis will turn out any differently than ride hailing? Their business model is basically a cheaper ride hail. And they make promises that they will be different because they don't have a human driver to discriminate against potential passengers and things like this. But the same issues we had with ride hail are coming back with robotaxi. There are concerns about labor with drivers being displaced. There's questions about whether the disabled community really will have the access that they've been promised. Uh, there's the issue that cheap taxis undermine public transit and can reduce the overall quality of transit in a city. And there's the issue of municipal preemption that the cities for ride hail and also for robotaxis have no control over issues that may arise. That's done at the state level, and the state regulators have been pretty permissive with letting these companies do whatever they want. Beyond that, for robotaxis in particular, they're ethical and related concerns. For example, are you imposing testing risk upon vulnerable populations? Is your long-term aspirational safety really incurring short-term risk, and is that okay? Additionally, right now, there's no requirement for independent safety oversight on a technical basis. Is that okay, or does that need to change? The last point, and perhaps the overarching point, is we need to see sustainable trust for this technology. The industry has a history of engaging in trust-degrading rhetoric, such as robotaxis won't make stupid driving mistakes. Well, you've seen the pictures. They're going to make stupid driving mistakes, just like people do and a relentless drumbeat of blame of human drivers. But it turns out we don't know which is going to be safer because robotaxis will make sometimes the same mistakes and sometimes different mistakes. We don't won't know what the relative outcome is going to be. These rhetorical tactics at first got support for the robotaxis, but now it's blown back on them as we found out that what they're saying really isn't true. And there's also trust degrading actions. Lobbying to make sure the cities don't have a say in what happens on the roads is a problem. Redacting withholding information is not being forthcoming with what happens in crashes is really making the industry look bad. There's some things the industry can do to increase trust. They can talk with, not at, stakeholders. In San Francisco, the city folks said that the companies would talk at them instead of with them. Uh, and that's been changing lately, and it needs to change in all the cities for all the companies. They need more transparency on incidents and corrective actions. They need to accept proportional responsibility for loss events. Right now, if the loss event is 49% their problem, they count it as if it's zero. And they need to say, well, you know, we could have done this better, even though the other guy's more at fault. We could have done this better. They need to be more forthcoming about those conversations. And they need to state the release criteria in advance and tracking metrics. Right now, the companies decide when they think they're good to go on the road, and there's no way to know whether they really are and there's no way to know how it turns out other than to read the newspaper. Summing up, there's some lessons for the autonomous vehicle industry to succeed. They need to realize that net better than a human driver isn't enough to see this through. That's only a starting point. They need to make sure they avoid negligent driving behavior, even if they're statistically better than a human driver. They need to avoid risk transfer onto vulnerable populations. They need to deal with the fact that regulatory risk management is fine grain. You can have statistical superior safety, but there's still dangerous behaviors. You're going to see a recall for those. They need to conform to industry standards to set a prior expectation of safety because they're not going to have the numbers to prove statistical safety on the first day or week or year. They need to address ethical and equity concerns much better than they are now. And ultimately, this is going to be about trust, and we're going to see how it turns out. I wish the industry the best success, but I hope that they take these lessons to heart.